So when you have a big cut, blood comes out and you die. Hi, I'm Milton Chang of Bonsai Heirloom. The first question is that I see many of your videos. I notice none of them have very uh, many uh, secondary or tertiary branching and they are all in a primary stage of development, even the ones you have for 50 years. Why is that? Well, the reason is uh, that I'm actually about, I would say seven years ago, started all over again. The trees I have for a very long time they were not being worked on, uh, but maybe five to 10 minutes a year for many, many years. So they have grown really out of shape. So about seven years ago, I joined the bonsai club locally and also starting to work on my bonsai. So then I went back and start over again, making sure they are, the, they are back to the design shape. And that's why they are kind of bare. And then about, I would say, when I do the video, uh, YouTube video, I started to pay more attention to the finishing look. Uh, or when I started thinking about start bones like heirlooms, so I had to figure out how to finish the tree by having more ramification or that. So I started working on that about five years ago. So many of my trees are still in the developmental stage, but I will show you uh, quite a number of my bonsai now have very good ramification. They look as good as the ones you see in bonsai books, but maybe not as, uh, maybe a little bit more sparse because I want to show the structure of the, the tree. So with that in mind, I defend myself to say that's because I, even though they're old, I had them for a very long time, but really only uh, working on them for the last uh, several years, five to seven years. Uh, everybody seemed to like the uh, valuable comment uh, content so the next question is that how do I basically how do I take a big tree and make it into a bonsai? And I don't have big equipment to dig them. Well, you, you know, there's a shovel I found. It's a kind of narrow, skinny shovel at the, the tip is kind of shallow, a uh, narrow, but it's a very long handle and it's very heavy. I would say a good 25 pounds. And you can just throw it into the soil and it will dig down deep. And that's how what we used to go out and take California juniper. Um, and and I think Randy Knight also uses that for digging uh, his uh, um, Sierra junipers and so forth. So I tried to find that in nursery shops, uh, uh, that a very heavy shovel, that's very easy for digging. So uh, for big trees, you can use that to help you dig. And the other thing I found very useful is a reciprocal saw, electric, or portable electric, what you can do is you can cut around the tree, like maybe a foot out, because you don't really need the roots extended out. So if you cut it that way and leave it in for a while, let the tap root feed the tree uh, to induce uh, fibrous roots, and then you dig it out uh, using the heavy shovel, I think uh, that would do it. And so the idea of the, um, uh, the big, uh, starting with a big tree is that you have a big trunk to show the age. Actually, come to think of it, when we describe the age of a tree, a bonsai, we should really list two uh, ages. And that's what my bonsai club, Seibuku, does. It lists the, uh, how old the tree and then how long it has been in training. So the point is that you can take a one-year-old tree or 20-year-old tree and you work on it in five years, both of them will look like finished bonsai. So to say that tree is a 55-year-old tree, 55-year-old uh, bonsai, that's really a bit of an exaggeration. So uh, that's what I would suggest is to uh, get a big trunk uh, to enhance the age of the bonsai. But in reality, the training, uh, the years in training is really not that many. So yeah, uh, they, by all means, take big trees and cut back drastically to size, and then you let it grow out again to fill out, and that's how you do a spectacular bonsai quickly. Are you ever bothered by the scouring on, uh, especially collect the tree? I attended a Kyoto show exhibit, and many of the decisions are shown without foliage, and I see no scar, they're really just beautiful. So I agree, I think, um, 
And many of the Japanese obons are, are really done so meticulously well. They are really, really beautiful. And they are no scar, everything's perfect. And my reaction is that that is really lovely. I think a bonsai basically are two aspects of it. One is uh, how artistic it is. And the second one is how well it's maintained. And the Japanese bonsai are superbly maintained. And, and yet in Japan, the big bonsai masters are referred as, they are referred to as giant bonsai craftsmen. Because bonsai, you are in Japan, the culture is to make bonsai as perfect as possible, like the existing ones that are revered. And so to me then, it's really beautiful. It is both art and craft. And the craft part overshadow a little bit of, in the sense of a, a more dominant than the art aspect of it. To me, I think it's really much more interesting to have a tree that look like it's weathered in the in uh, weathered in in the wilderness, and then it's got the ramification and the the branching, in the secondary or tertiary branching, to make it like uh, it's really being cared for, and it's been recovering, and that's what I envision envision, what American bonsai in American style will become, that's both craftsman and art, but emphasizing the artistic and natural aspect of it. I think that's what I would like to advocate. So both are good. Never criticize anything because each had its own merit, but rather uh, absorb what is there, internalize it and keep the good and shed the things that you don't quite like. And that's how you create your own style. I have a few cork elms, the Chinese elms, and uh, other trees, the elm is on a, the cork bark elm is on a rock. I wonder, uh, I want the thing to be thickened, and yet I don't want it to grow out of shape in a sense of a oversized respect to the rock. Well, that's very simple. What you do is that you keep uh, the vision in mind, the rock and the tree, the relative size of it, and you do as much as you can, keep the tree, prune the tree back, to where you want it to be and never let it go much beyond that. Let's say you can let it go out a fraction of an inch every time. So you have many, many years to keep the same proportion, but just keep it drastically. In fact, that will induce a lot of ramification to make your tree look good. And that's how people appreciate it. A, a tree that's artistically styled and also a lot of ramification well taken care of. The last three question, uh, it came from one that started last week. Uh, I got a uh, uh, input from a Brazilian audience that says in Brazil, we recommend it to never clip the tree uh, during the uh, bright moon or the high noon, uh, moon, in a sense, during high tide. And I think that's kind of related to an earlier one, even earlier one, is that the the urban legend is to never clip a tree when it's actively growing because it may bleed to death. And, and, I, and I pointed out that um, uh, trees don't store blood like, or moisture like human beings. So when you have a big cut, blood comes out and you die. Uh, whereas in tree, it will kind of slow down the bleeding when the liquid goes out enough. And then it will gradually suck up and it will heal and water will continue to be sucked up by the roots and so that it will re re reach an equilibrium. So feel free to cut back your tree at any time. You're not going to cause it to bleed to death. And this one is probably the same idea to have the idea to never clip during a uh, bright moon. And the reason I think is also worry about bleeding. And the idea is that, you know, uh, when you have bright moon, the tide is high which means there's more gravity force for, uh, 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 forcing the, 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 uh, the tide to rise. So, well, I'm sorry, I haven't practiced physics analyses for a very long time. So I finally decided I need to do that to show you the argument that this is a kind of a silly thing. My first, uh, my response to the first one from the Brazilian reader, uh, audience is that uh, that's a silly, uh, ridiculous uh, urban legend, but I shouldn't do that. I should be more respectful. So let, let me be respectful. Basically, 
the reason why the tide rises is that the distance between the Earth and the moon is about 225,000 miles. And the fluctuation between the closest time and the farthest time of the moon is about 30,000. So there's a ratio of 30,000 to 240,000, the ratio of the distance change. And the gravitational force is the square of the distance. So you take the ratio and square it. The effect is really, really minuscule. It's like 85, 850,000 uh, times uh, um, change, uh, a fraction of a change. So with that in mind, that I really don't, yes, the tide do, the challenging questions, well, so why would tide rise? Well, tide does rise due to the small fluctuation in the distance. But on the other hand, the force is so little in terms of insert on the tree, it absolutely will not feel it. So please feel free to clip your bonsai any time of the year, and also feel free to clip any time of the day or night, uh, so long as you can see where you're going with the tree. That means bright room, you can see, bright, bright moon, you can see where you're going. Okay, with that light note, I thank you very much for watching. Uh, please click like. I'm enjoying my video, and I hope you are too. And to subscribe to our channel so we'll let you know our uh, announcements of new video, interesting video. So with that in mind, and thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next week.